Hey, it's Sam O, and welcome to Ahrefs' advanced course on link building. Now, there are a lot of ways to interpret the word advanced, so let's walk through what you'll learn, what you won't learn, and I'll give you a breakdown of the course. Our course is designed to help you break away from traditional link building tactics that everyone is doing and improve your processes to create a highly effective link building team. You'll learn how to find prospects with what I call the seed and lookalike approach, craft personalized and benefit rich outreach emails, and you'll learn how to validate your link building campaigns with minimal effort using a process called a blitz list. On top of that, I'll show you how to structure your team and manage it to maximize your efficiency and scale your link building operations. Now, we won't spend any time talking about common link building tactics like guest posting or resource page link building. We already have in-depth tutorials on these tactics on our YouTube channel and blog. Instead, we'll be peeling back the layers of the stages of link building to make your efforts more efficient and effective. Let's jump into the first lesson, which is on the role of content in link building. Now, the reason why I want to explore this first is because content and link building are inseparable. And while many get this in theory, they don't put it into practice. Let me paint a picture for you that I see time and time again. So people will often start with keyword research. They'll research subtopics and create content hubs because structure is important. They'll hit the publish button and then be like, oh yeah, we're going to need links to rank for these topics. So they look at who's linking to the top ranking pages for their main topics. Then they export backlink profiles, filter prospects by metrics, and then do some sort of shotgun approach where they send a gazillion emails hoping for a 0.5% link acquisition rate. Then to excuse themselves from blatantly spamming the population of a small town, they say, link building is a numbers game. You just gotta keep on sending those emails. Now, assuming you're not paying for links or doing link exchanges at scale, your content should dictate your outreach pitches. Your content is actually what gives you a good reason to contact someone and ask for a link. It sets context for your first conversation around a common interest or belief. Now, quick disclaimer, I'm not saying that link building is not a numbers game, but I don't think we should be bragging about 0.5% link acquisition rates because it doesn't have to be this painful or spammy. And I'm not saying that paying for links or doing link exchanges are ineffective. These are just blatantly against Google's terms of service and we don't practice that at Ahrefs. Plus, on a personal note, the harder link building gets, the more I love the game. All right, now let's dig a bit deeper into the content aspect. Your content type matters in terms of success rates. As a very general rule of thumb, informational content like how-tos, tutorials, and data studies are going to be easier to get links to than product pages, affiliate posts, or anything commercial for that matter. Why? Because there are a lot more opportunities to bake value into informational content. And again, value should be tied to your pitch angles. Whereas commercial content is tougher to insert value specifically for things like product pages, where the only real beneficiary of value is the recipient of the link. Now, because this is only meant to be a foundational lesson, I won't expand on baking value into informational content right now, because first, we need to understand why people link to pages. Actually, seeing as a link is essentially an author sharing information through their website with web visitors, it's easiest if we ask ourselves, why do people share the things they share? So as an example, a friend might share the latest news article or a recipe because they recently had a conversation about it. Parents share things with kids to sometimes pass down nuggets of wisdom. Kids often share things with parents, seeking wisdom or expressing a complaint. In all of these examples, there's a relationship. Now, if we put this in the context of link building, why does an author share another person's page via a hyperlink with their readers who are mostly anonymous strangers? And while there's no set list of reasons, here are some common ones. Number one, they link to pages to reference or support their point. Statistics are probably the most common. For example, if we look at the anchors report for our SEO statistics page, you'll see that nearly all of our links are a result of specific stats that were mentioned. Number two, they reference something they don't need or want to expand on. For example, teamwork.com wrote this guide on SEO project management. And under the heading, what is SEO project management? They say an SEO campaign encompasses various tasks 
such as technical SEO, a content audit, keyword research, etc. And for each area of SEO, they've linked to a guide, including our posts on keyword research. For a topic like SEO project management, there's no point in expanding on these techniques because it's easier to direct readers to a place where they can learn more about it if they want to. Number three, it makes them look good. People often link to things like high profile mentions because it helps them build credibility and social proof with visitors. For example, this site has an in the press page where most links are from listicles on things they value and or make them look good. So things like best gift sets is saying, see, our product is awesome. Or top native owned businesses tells us a bit about their values and roots. In fact, creating pages that mention and portray a person or company in a positive way is a link building tactic on its own, often referred to as ego bait. Basically, SEOs create content like this, where they mention influential people, which often baits people into linking to them. It doesn't always work for Megalist, but it has worked exceptionally well for Inc's list of the Inc 5000. Inc Magazine publishes a list of the top 5,000 most successful companies in the US annually. And as a result, they earn hundreds or even thousands of links every single year. And if we look at the backlinks for their 2021 list, you'll see that tons of these links are from home pages where companies are showing off their award. And the fourth reason is that there's a relationship, whether it's explicit or implicit. Implicit relationships are usually content superfans. And while it's tough to build a content fan base, they're super effective in link building because they trust what's written on a site without a shadow of a doubt. When they guest post, they frequently link to you. When they go on podcast interviews, they frequently mention your content, which often gets linked to in show notes. Explicit relationships, on the other hand, are your online friends who you talk shop with. And what often creates these professional relationships is respect and admiration for each other's work. As a result, you want to link to each other's content, whether that's on your own site or on other people's sites. This is one of the most powerful link building advantages you can have because the bottom line is that you want to help each other succeed. Now, a few commonalities with most of these reasons are A, people link to things to prove that they're not making stuff up. B, they link to things to add credibility to themselves or their companies. Or C, they link to things they trust. These are three main things you need to consider when you're reaching out for links, because if you go in with your own agenda to satisfy your needs and only your needs, then your intentions will be quite clear and your chances of getting a link without paying for it will be very slim. Now, this might seem all meta and unfortunately, knowing why people link usually won't be enough to get you links. It's just foundational for your outreach pitches. And this list is far from exhaustive. You need to dig into the data, and the best place to start is by analyzing how similar pages got their links, because by understanding the how, you're able to infer the why, which also helps to form your angles of attack for your link outreach pitches. So in the next lesson, we're going to talk about competitor analysis, specifically analyzing how similar pages got their links. In this lesson, we're going to talk about how to research a page's backlinks to understand how they were built or earned. And this is a super important skill to have because if you understand how a page got its links, then you'll have direction in terms of how to replicate that link profile. And of course, we'll go through some examples in this lesson. All right, so the first thing we need to do is find a competing page to analyze. Now, if your page is targeting a topic with the intent to rank, a good place to start finding competitors are the top 10 ranking pages for your target query. After all, backlinks are likely a reason for their high ranking position, especially if it's a competitive, non-local, non-freshness dependent query. For example, at Ahrefs, we obviously want to rank high for queries like link building because our tools are essential for this process. Now, if we look at the SERP overview table in Keywords Explorer for that query, you'll see that similar guides from Moz and Backlinko have a lot more referring domains than us, which is likely the primary reason they rank ahead of our page. So these are two link profiles I definitely want to check out. Now to see the backlink profiles, just click on the number in the backlinks column and you'll be able to see the pages that link to these competing guides. We'll circle back to this in a bit because you won't always be building links to pages that target a keyword. For example, topics for linkable assets often have no search volume, 
but they have the potential to earn massive amounts of links because of their appeal. And then SEOs will add internal links from these pages to more commercial pages passing PageRank. Now, if you're working on a linkable asset, chances are you fall into one of two categories. Category one, you are inspired from another page that's generated a ton of links and you want to create a similar page. If that's the case, then you already know the URL of your competing page. So just throw it into a competitor analysis tool like Site Explorer, hit the backlinks report, and you're in the same place as we were for our previous example. Now, if you're in category two, you know you want to create a linkable asset, but you don't know the exact angle you'll be going with. If this is the case, then you can use a tool like Ahrefs Content Explorer, where you can search through billions of pages and get SEO metrics on them. For example, if you have a personal finance site, you can start with a broad search like personal finance. Next, I'll set a referring domains filter to narrow in on pages that have at least 100 referring domains. And to filter out a lot of low quality results, I'll exclude subdomains. As a final measure, I'll actually set a page traffic filter to only show pages that have a maximum value of a thousand organic visits. Meaning we don't want to see pages that get a ton of search traffic because these are likely ones that you've discovered through keyword research and would fall into the first example of pages with the intent to rank for a popular query. Now from here, you just need to skim through the results and look for topics that might inspire you. And I know that finding inspiration sounds kind of cliche, but this is where your expertise and creativity will guide you to your idea. For example, this page from opensecrets.org has collected over 800 referring domains. And as you can see from the description, it's a page about the personal finances and net worth of members of Congress. And if we actually click through to that page, you'll see that it's basically just a curation of Congress members and their estimated wealth. Now, I won't dig too deep into this, but I will make a couple of points to support why this could be a good competing page to analyze. Number one, we already know they have tons of referring domains. Number two, their data is around four years old as the article was published in October 2017 and doesn't appear to have been updated. And number three, US politics and especially wealth inequality have become more prominent topics since the money printers went crazy in 2020. All right, so now that we have a potential competing page to analyze, I'll click on the carrot and then go to the backlinks report to get to where we need to be. Okay, so we found two backlink profiles to analyze. Let's look at one of the competing pages on link building first. Now remember, our objective is to understand how these targets got their backlinks to see if we can replicate similar links. And in order to do that, you first need to understand the context of those links, meaning what are these referring pages talking about and why do they need to link to this target? So the first place you'll want to look in this report is the anchors and target URL column. Now, as you can see, this page has thousands of links, which will be tough to filter through. So with big link profiles, I actually prefer to start at the anchors report because it summarizes the backlink profile nicely. So what I'm looking for are specific points that are frequently mentioned because this is usually a sign of a linkable point. In other words, if lots of referring domains are linking to the guide with the same anchor, then that point likely resonated with readers and the linkerati. So these are the things that I look to replicate in our content. Now, looking at the anchors report, I generally ignore things like the title of the post, naked URLs, and branded anchors, because these are less likely to be replicable. So for this page, something that stands out is the most creative link building post ever. And seeing as it's title cased, it likely means there was a redirect that happened at some point when the article had a different title, because that's not the title today. And if we click to see the links to the target, you'll see that it was indeed from a redirect from the acquisition of point blank SEO. Now that page is responsible for over 130 referring domains, meaning the 130 websites that are linking to this guide through a redirect are likely irrelevant today. So there's an opportunity for an outreach angle and prospects to back it. Now, if we continue scrolling through the anchors, you'll see this one that says download ebook. And if we look at the links to the target, it is indeed going to the original guide. But if you look at the actual page itself, there's no mention of an ebook or to download anything. So these are also irrelevant links and we could technically package up our post in a downloadable ebook pretty easily. Let's dig deeper. 
If I click on that anchor, it'll open the backlinks report with some filters set. And you'll see that there are only a few decent sites within this small list of prospects. So you might conclude that it's not worth turning our guide into an ebook for a maximum of three links, right? Not necessarily. A commonality among these pages is that they're all list posts on free SEO ebooks. So as a link builder, you need to follow the rabbit hole to see if there's a bigger opportunity here. So I'll go to Ahrefs Content Explorer and search for SEO ebook in the search box, and I'll set the mode to a title search. Now, seeing as we won't want to pitch the same website multiple times, I'll set the one page per domain filter. From here, I'll set a couple metric filters like a minimum DR of 20 and a minimum website traffic of 1000. And now we're left with over 300 link prospects to filter through. Not bad. But if we wanted to expand this list, all we need to do is change the word SEO to something like marketing. And now you have nearly 1500 more prospects. So is it worth creating a link building ebook? It's probably worth a shot. And we'll build onto this example throughout the course. All right, now let's look at a second example, which was a link baity post on the wealth of Congress members. To jog your memory, the data from the post is from 2017 to 2018, meaning it's pretty outdated today. So if we were to create a similar page, we'd want to create something with up-to-date data. Now, because we know that content and links are inseparable, as I had shared in the previous lesson, we need to figure out which parts of the content are attributable to the backlinks. So we're going to be looking for linkable points. Because this page has a ton of links pointing to it, I'm going to go to the anchors report as a starting point. And again, I'll ignore things like naked URLs and branded anchors, as it's generally tough to replicate these unless it's on listicles like best product type, i.e. best SEO tools. Now, if we look at the first anchor, you'll see that it has something to do with financial disclosure forms. And if we look at the actual links, you'll see that probably all of them are from content syndications seeing as the date of publishing is pretty much the same for all links. Plus, the anchors and surrounding text are identical. So we need to ask ourselves, based on this point, can we replicate these links? Well, in order to do that, you need a big news publication to write a story and link to your page. Then other publications would need to syndicate that content, and no guarantees there. You'd basically need to carefully plan and execute a successful PR campaign. So in my opinion, it's not easily replicable. But as you continue to scroll through the report, one interesting thing that stands out for me are a lot of links that include a dollar figure amount. Five members worth $100 million or more, $79 million, $148.4 million, and $251 million to name a few. So I'll go to the backlinks report and I'll enter the dollar sign in the search box. Then I'll set the filter to search in the anchors with surrounding text. And now we have a list of around 50 link prospects. Let's dig a bit deeper. The first backlink is anchored on US rep Daryl Issa, but his name isn't on the page. The same goes for this one on Scott Peters. Now, if you continue to dig through the reasons for these links, you'll find that a bunch of the people mentioned are actually not on the page. And for those that are, their net worth has likely changed over the past few years. So with these things in mind, if I were to create a post on this topic, I'd probably include wealth estimations on both current and past members of Congress. I dig up as many financial disclosure forms as I could find on each person and link them up. And design and UX would probably be a top priority to make this information searchable and easy to digest. Now, would this work to generate a ton of links? No one really knows. And that's the thing about link building. We need to make informed decisions based on a blend of data, creativity, and some common sense. And by ensuring that your content supports both your link outreach pitches and the reason why people link to a page, you'll increase your chances of having more successful campaigns. And we'll wrap things up here because in the next module, we're going to be talking about link prospecting and how you can do it efficiently for scale. And no, I'm not talking about spamming random people. I'll see you in the next module. Hey, it's Ammo and welcome to the second module, which is all about link prospecting. Now I've structured this module in three lessons where each lesson represents a step in creating personalized and scalable link building campaigns. Step one is to find your seed prospects, which is what this lesson is all about. Step two is to find lookalike prospects based on your seeds, 
which will broaden the scope of your link building campaign. And step three is to segment your prospects, which will help you scale your campaigns in a personalized way. So let's get started with finding seed prospects. Seed prospects are simply people who link to a page for a specific reason. For example, did they link because of a specific point that was made in the content? Is it because they liked the brand or was it something else? Now, finding seed prospects is important because it'll do two things for you. Number one, you'll understand why people are linking to a page. And number two, because you know why, you'll know how to approach them in your outreach pitch. And we'll get into some examples in a bit. Now, the most important skill for a prospector to have when it comes to finding seed prospects is the ability to identify patterns. And by pattern, I'm referring to common reasons for linking or a commonality among linking pages. Now, we've already gone through a couple of examples in the previous module, but I want to talk about how you can find opportunities for your own site. And it's really just about looking for patterns in three places when analyzing a competing page's link profile. And these places are the context of the backlinks, which help you understand why people are linking to a page, and we'll specifically be looking at anchors and surrounding text, the referring page's titles, which tells you where their links are coming from and or the types of pages they're coming from, and the actual content, which tells you what your email pitch will be based on. So let's start off by looking at the context of links to a competing page. Just as I showed you in lesson 1.2, studying the anchors of a competing page's backlinks can help you understand why people link to a page. And these whys can often be considered as linkable points. For example, when we created our SEO stats page, we looked at the anchors profile for top ranking pages and we immediately noticed that the majority of links were attributable to specific stats that were mentioned. This is a pattern. Now, if we click on the 93% anchor, it'll open up the backlinks report with that anchor set in the filters. And as you can see, the context of the link is 93% of online experiences begin with a search engine. Now, this stat alone doesn't help with a pitch angle. You have to look for a pitch angle that's related to the stat. And it was pretty easy for us to come up with one because if you click through to that page, you'll see that 93% isn't even mentioned on it. Plus, the stat was around a decade old, meaning it's completely irrelevant today because the way we use the internet has changed a lot. So as a pitch angle, we could say something like, hey, you mentioned this stat, but where'd you get that from? The page you're linking to doesn't say that. Plus, recent stats show that 68% of online experiences begin with a search engine, blah, blah, blah. All right, let's move on to the second place to look, and that's the referring page titles of a competing page's backlinks. In the previous module, we discovered some pages that are linking to a link building guide. And the reason for them linking is because that guide used to have an ebook. So as you can see from the anchors, the linking pages are saying to go and download an ebook. Now, seeing as there's really only a few good linking pages, it wouldn't be worth creating an ebook to maybe get a few links we need to look for a commonality that can potentially expand our pool of prospects. And that commonality is in the titles of referring pages. As you can see, all of the titles are listicles on free SEO eBooks. So our seed prospects are listicles on SEO eBooks. As for the pitch angle, we can simply pitch a free eBook without any kind of opt-in, which many of their recommendations use. Not a great benefit packed pitch, but it's a good starting point. All right, the third place to look for patterns is the actual content itself. And the easiest thing you can look for is incorrect, dangerous, or outdated recommendations. Now, this one is quite situational, but nevertheless, it's something worth paying attention to because it works pretty well. I'll give you an example in the SEO industry. So this page on LSI keywords has over 500 referring domains, but there's no such thing as LSI keywords. LSI stands for latent semantic indexing, and in short, it's an indexing method and has nothing to do with keywords. Now, today, this page explains that LSI keywords aren't really a thing, but when it was first published, it was a full-blown guide on how to use these quote-unquote LSI keywords, meaning everyone who linked to the page prior to the update was linking to inaccurate information. So our seed prospects are anyone who's linking to this guide prior to it being updated, or, anyone who's recommending their readers to use LSI keywords. As for the pitch, we could just tell them that there's no such thing as LSI keywords and recommend our content, which explains what LSI is, how it actually works, 
and also mentioned that we talk about whether using related words, phrases, and entities actually help to rank higher in Google, meaning we address the reason why they recommended using these so-called LSI keywords in the first place. Now, these are just a few places to look that can help surface some unique prospecting opportunities. But you don't need to limit yourself to these because then you're just stuck in the box of Sam. The point of this lesson is to show you how finding a pattern or footprint that has a pitch angle baked into it can be the foundation for link outreach campaigns. This is a skill that I highly recommend working on because it's what you'll need to find seed prospects. From there, it's just about following that footprint to find more prospects like your seeds. And in the next lesson, we're going to talk about using your seeds to expand your list of prospects as well as the tools you can use. In this lesson, we're going to talk about how to grow your list of prospects with lookalike prospects. And the name lookalike prospects is inspired by lookalike audiences, which is commonly used in online advertising. Now, if you're unfamiliar with lookalike audiences, ad platforms like Google and Facebook let you target people who are similar to an existing audience. For example, people that are like your customers or website visitors. And by targeting these lookalike audiences, you're able to reach new people who are likely to be interested in your business because they share similar characteristics to your existing customers or website visitors. Now, lookalike prospects and link building are very much the same. You're trying to find people who are similar to a seed prospect, which is something we covered in the previous lesson. But as a refresher, seed prospects are people who link to a page for a specific reason. And these specific reasons are what I call linkable points which are usually identified by patterns in a competing page's link profile. Best of all, these linkable points help us to define our pitch angles. Now, if this went over your head, then I highly recommend watching lesson 2.1 on finding seed prospects so you can get the most value from this lesson. All right, so there are three tools I use to find lookalike prospects. The first is Ahrefs, more specifically, Ahrefs Site Explorer, Content Explorer, SEO Toolbar, and Batch Analysis. The second tool is Google, and the third is the Scraper Chrome extension. With that said, let's go through some examples of finding lookalike prospects based on a seed, and we'll continue with the examples we discussed in the previous lesson. All right, the first example is for our SEO statistics page. When we were creating this page, we analyzed the competing pages anchors report in Ahrefs Site Explorer, and we noticed the pattern that the majority of links to this page were because of a specific stat. Now, when we went to visit these pages, we noticed that a lot of the stats that were in the anchors report weren't even on the page or they were just super outdated. So we had a couple pitch angles to run with. Now, usually when you find these patterns or linkable points in a competitor's backlink profile, you'll likely want to get an understanding of the breadth of the opportunity. And this will help you gauge whether it'll be worth your time and effort to pursue it. The easiest way to do that is to look for a footprint within a pattern and a footprint is just a common mark among a data set. So in this case, the footprint would be the percent sign. Now with footprint in hand, we can go to the backing support and use the filters to narrow in on relevant opportunities. And because our footprint is a percent sign in the anchor or surrounding text of the backlink, I'll type that into the search box and choose anchors with surrounding text as the search mode. And as you can see, there are around 1800 pages from unique websites that link to this page because of a specific stat. That's a pretty nice opportunity in my opinion. Now, we didn't stop here. We also looked at other anchors profiles for other top ranking pages that had a significant number of referring domains. And we basically just did the exact same thing and found well over 3000 lookalike prospects to our seed. All right, the next example was when we found an opportunity for our link building guide. What we noticed was that a competing page was getting backlinks because they used to have a downloadable ebook in their link building guide. And like the previous example, there was no CTA or mention of a downloadable ebook on the page. Now, the pattern I noticed is that all of the referring pages are on the topic of top SEO ebooks. So that means our seed prospects are people who have a listicle on the top SEO ebooks. So what we need to search for are titles of pages that include the word best or top, which implies a listicle, and SEO ebooks, which implies the main topic. So to find our lookalike prospects, we can use Google search or Ahrefs Content Explorer. 
In Google search, you can type in something like in title colon best, in title colon SEO, in title colon ebook. And we're left with a few hundred results. Now you can enable Ahrefs SEO toolbar to get both domain and page level metrics on the results. And if you prefer to work in Excel or Sheets, you can export the SERP as needed. But this job is much easier if you use Ahrefs Content Explorer. So I'll search for best or top within parentheses and then SEO ebook. Finally, I'll change the search mode to title and run the search. And now you can see a few hundred results along with their SEO metrics. And this report is also filterable and exportable too. Now, if you want to further expand your list of lookalike prospects, you can simply change the word SEO to something like marketing, since link building is a smaller part of the broader marketing category. And now we have well over a thousand prospects in total for this campaign. All right, so the final seed we talked about was for our page that debunks myths behind so-called LSI keywords. Now we established that our seed prospect is any page that recommends using LSI keywords because there's no such thing as LSI keywords. And while there are a few hundred prospects in the link profile we looked at in lesson 2.1, we can easily find a bigger list of lookalike prospects using Content Explorer. So this time I'm going to search for use LSI keywords as a phrase match, which is surface pages where authors are recommending visitors to use so-called LSI keywords. And now we have thousands of prospects who've said this phrase on their page. So it would just be a matter of vetting these pages and we'll get into this in the next module. Now, these are just a few methods that I would use to find lookalike prospects for these hypothetical campaigns. And while there are other ways to generate similar results, I won't bother going into them because the most important part of this exercise is to understand how seed prospects help to broaden the scope of your campaign with lookalike prospects. Now, there's one more technique to finding lookalike prospects I want to talk about, and it's not so much about finding them necessarily, but it's an efficient technique that I find myself using pretty frequently, and that's scraping. There are going to be times when you're browsing the web and you notice a potential seed that's worth exploring. For example, I was looking for ways to build links to our SEO course landing page in Ahrefs Academy, and I went through the usual routine of analyzing the backlink profiles of competing pages. Now, this was all well and good, but then I happened to find another low hanging opportunity that none of our organic search competitors would be able to do. And I discovered it in YouTube analytics. I realized that our SEO course videos had gotten over a million views in less than a year. So I was like, man, I'm sure someone has linked to these videos or embedded it in their posts at some point. Meaning these are warm prospects who I could reach out to and ask to link to our academy instead. Basically, my idea followed a similar concept to unlinked mentions, which usually has a pretty high conversion rate for us. So I ran the video URL in Ahrefs Site Explorer, and sure enough, this video had collected a ton of referring domains. And I also checked the embed URL for the same video in Site Explorer. And there were even more referring domains to sort through. So our seed prospect for this hypothetical campaign is anyone linking to one of our SEO course videos on our YouTube channel or anyone that's embedded the video on their page. Now, because there's a total of 15 videos of this course on our YouTube channel, I needed to get all of the URLs so I can run them through a tool like Ahrefs Batch Analysis. And to do that, I use the Chrome Scraper extension. All you need to do is right click on the information you want to scrape and click Scrape Similar. From here, I modified the XPath code a bit and within seconds, we had a full list of URLs ready to batch analyze. Finally, I ran the URLs through Ahrefs Batch Analysis, sorted by referring domains, and I could instantly see that we had a huge list of lookalike prospects that might be willing to link to our Academy page. As you can see, finding lookalike prospects is all about finding a footprint within your seed and following the rabbit hole. And when you have a general scope of the breadth of the campaign, you're able to get an idea if actually running the campaign will be worth your time and effort. Now, when you're dealing with thousands of potential link prospects with multiple seeds, it can get quite messy. Plus, sending personalized emails at scale is tough. And that's where segmenting your link prospects is going to help you stay organized, convert more emails into links, and save you a ton of time. So in the next lesson, we're going to talk about how you can effectively segment your prospects 
so you can scale personalized outreach campaigns. In this lesson, we're going to talk about segmenting your link prospects so you can send personalized emails at scale. And we'll basically be putting together the pieces from lesson 2.1 on finding seed prospects and lesson 2.2 on finding lookalike prospects. So if you haven't watched those yet, then I highly recommend doing that before you continue. Now, I wanna clarify what I mean by personalized emails. In my opinion, good personalized emails are ones where the context of your pitch is relevant to something specific they've done or said, or something that's important to them. For example, if you wanted to get a link from a page on budgeting, saying something like this wouldn't be personalized in my books. Hey Mitch, I read your post on budgeting methods. I have a page on credit cards and how it can help people budget. Link to me. All this shows is that you've extracted the main topic from the title. On the other hand, if you were to say something like, Hey Mitch, I saw that you're recommending the 50-30-20 rule in your budgeting guide. Not sure if you're actually using this method for budgeting, but I tried it and it absolutely sucked. I found it to be flawed because of this. So I created a new budgeting method called the 95-5 rule, which does that. My personal savings have gone up by 47% in the last year and should only compound going forward. Would love to get your feedback and perhaps a mention in your post if you dig it. The context of the pitch, feedback and a mention, aka a link, is relevant to something that they've said, and that's recommending the 50-30-20 budget rule. Now, this lesson is not about outreach pitches. We'll get to that in a later module. The key takeaway from these examples is that linkable points, aka the things that reveal your seed prospects, naturally make your outreach emails personalized. And because lookalike prospects are basically mirrors of your seeds, you can send almost the exact same email while maintaining the personalization factor, enabling you to scale your outreach campaigns. Now, to do it efficiently, all you need to do is group your prospects by segment, and each segment will get its own unique email. This, in my opinion, is a much better way to segment your link prospects compared to more common techniques based on metric groupings. Let's run through an example of how we did this for our SEO stats page. As I mentioned in previous lessons, when we were creating our SEO statistics page, we looked at the anchors report of competing pages and noticed that the majority of links were attributable to a specific stat. For example, you'll see that the stat 93%, which is in the context of online experiences, has led to hundreds of referring domains. But when we went to the page, there wasn't even a mention of that stat on it. So we did some research and found a more recent stat and added that to our content. 68% of online experiences begin with a search engine. Now, by including this stat in our post, we could send a relevant pitch like, hey, you're mentioning this 93% stat, but it's not on the page you're linking to. Plus, that's super outdated anyway. More recent research shows that 68% of online experiences begin with a search engine. So with that solidified, we just need to find lookalike prospects that mention the old stat 93% of online experiences begin with a search engine. To do that, we went to the backlinks report and set the include filter to show backlinks that mention 93 in the anchor or surrounding text of backlinks. And just like that, we had a segment of over 800 prospects we could send virtually the same email to while keeping it personalized. Then we did the same thing for the next stat. And if we added that stat to our page, we would create another segment for our outreach campaign. And within an hour or so, our segments look like this where the stat column represents the segment and the number of referring domains represents the size of the opportunity. Now, let's say that the number of links you got wasn't enough to take pole position. How would you continue to find new lookalike prospects? Well, you could look for more seeds and lookalikes, or you can automate prospecting with your existing seeds with Ahrefs mentions or backlinks alerts. You can set up a backlinks alert with a competing URL and get notified when that page gets new links. But for link prospecting, I find mentions alerts to be much more effective. Ahrefs mentions alerts actually uses the same database as Content Explorer. So all you would need to do is set your search query to a footprint like 93% of online experiences and set some base level metrics filters. Now, anytime someone mentions that on a page and our crawler discovers it, you'll get notified via email at your set interval and you can quickly reach out and ask for a link. This, my friends, is the power of segmentation. 
and I may sound like that monkey who won't stop banging on the cymbals, but I really want to bring emphasis on the importance of these three steps in link prospecting. Finding good seeds helps you to carefully craft your content and define your pitch angles. Finding lookalike prospects helps you to create a sizable and relevant list of prospects. And segmentation helps you to scale personalized emails. Everything is connected. Now, when we had a list of well over a thousand link prospects, we didn't just blindly email everyone who set a specific stat. There's a process to choose who you should contact, and that happens in the vetting stage. And that's what the next module is all about. I'll see you there. Hey, it's Ammo, and welcome to the third module, which is all about vetting and validating link prospects. Now, straight up, this stage is kind of boring. You're basically taking your huge list of unfiltered prospects and checking them for a couple of things. In short, you want to make sure that A, they're actually links you want, and B, that your link pitches will be relevant. Now, before we can get into tips on doing it fast, let's get on the same page of how you do it slowly, step by step. So when you're vetting prospects using the methods I taught in the last module, there are three steps you can do. I like to look at them in levels depending on the size of the prospect list. Level one is to narrow down your list of prospects by SEO metrics. Two common metrics people often use are domain rating and domain level website traffic. Domain rating basically tells us whether a site has followed links across their domain. And this is important to some people because if a website has low authority, then chances are you won't get much page rank by getting a link from a page on their site. Now, DR is far from perfect because A, it's a third party metric and B, PR flows at the page level. So I personally don't put too much weight on this metric. As for total website traffic, it gives us a hint whether the site is likely in good standing with Google. For example, it's unlikely that you'll see a DR90 site with zero website traffic unless they've been hit by Google. In my opinion, it makes sense to use filters when you're working with hundreds or potentially thousands of link prospects. And while you may filter out a handful of decent prospects, you'll likely remove more low quality prospects than good ones. So the time savings is worth it. Now, trusting these metrics alone would be a mistake. This leads us nicely into level two, which is to ensure that prospects pages are relevant to the page you'll be pitching. Now, in this stage, you can just scan the titles of your prospects pages, which should give us hints into what the page is about. For example, if we were building links to our SEO stats page based on the people linking to this competing URL, you'll see from the titles of referring pages that they're all pretty relevant. This one's on SEO interview questions and answers. This one's on the best digital marketing channels. Then there's this one on ranking on the first page of Google, and so on. But as you continue to go down the list, you might question whether this one on the best online shopping sites in Singapore is worth reaching out to. The page itself doesn't seem super relevant to me, but the domain is media1marketing.com. So it sounds like a marketing agency to me, which is relevant to SEO and our page on SEO stats. So I personally keep it in our list at this point, but it wouldn't exactly be a high priority prospect in my opinion. As for a page like this, which is on lead gen competitive advantages for pest control, I just exclude it. I'd also exclude pages in other languages because my content would be in English and so would my outreach pitch. All right, on to level three, which is to validate that your pitch angle is relevant. Now, because our prospecting method revolves around finding seed prospects based on a linkable point, that means we need to check each prospect's page to make sure they're still mentioning that point. For example, in our SEO stats campaign, I exported all backlinks that mentioned 93 in the anchor and surrounding text. And I did this because the organic competitors page doesn't mention the stat, meaning all links pointing to the page because of the 93% stat are now irrelevant. This also means we need to validate that the prospects still mention the stat on the page, because if they're not, then our personalized email saying, hey, you're mentioning this 93% stat, just wouldn't make sense. So in this case, vetting the page would actually require us to visit these URLs and do a find on the page for 93. Now, while it only takes around 30 seconds to verify that a page still mentions the stat, if you have a thousand pages to inspect, then that's 500 minutes or over eight hours of work. Plus, it's a super monotonous task that's prone to human error. But the good news is that you can do it more accurately in under five minutes 
by using Screaming Frog's custom search feature. To set it up, click on Configuration, then hover over Custom and choose Search. Now I'll name our custom search to 93%. Make sure the condition is Contains and then type 93 in the search box. Now I'll choose Page Text from the dropdown and we're all set to go. Now all I have to do is run the 875 URLs in list mode and run the crawl. From here, you can go to the custom search tab, choose your filter in the dropdown, and you'll see a list of all URLs that match your custom search. So in our case, 779 URLs of the 875 that we crawled mention our linkable point, meaning 96 pages either didn't match the footprint or returned a non-200 response code. So that saved us around 48 minutes of precious vetting time. Now, it's not always possible to vet at scale like this, and that usually depends on the complexity of your linkable point. For example, we found some lookalike prospects in Content Explorer by searching for use LSI keywords as our query. And our hope was to find pages that recommend using so-called LSI keywords, because again, they don't exist. Now, as for our pitch, we might try to gently educate prospects on so-called LSI keywords and offer suggestions to update their content with more accurate information, where our guide could potentially be an additional resource. Now, just because a page says, use LSI keywords, it doesn't mean they're all recommending to use them. In fact, this page has the phrase, use LSI keywords on it, but the context of the mention is, does Google use them? And in this section, they quote John Mueller saying that they're not a thing. Unfortunately for complex linkable points like this, where footprints can have various contexts, the only way to vet these prospects is manually. And I'll talk about hiring good vetters in our last module on team building. Now, after you've finished your page vetting process, you'll need to start finding the right people to send your email pitches to. And personally, I consider this a part of the vetting process because there's research involved to validate whether the prospect is a good one or not. So in the next lesson, I'll share my experiences on contacting people with different titles, i.e. author, editor, generic emails, etc. And I'll share some stats on who the best person to contact with your link pitch is. In this lesson, we're going to talk about who you should contact with your link outreach pitches. Now, generally speaking, you'll want to contact one of these four people the author, editor, marketing or content marketing manager, or a webmaster. And if you can't find contacts for any of these people, a last resort may be to reach out to a generic email like support at, or contact at, or help at, or whatever. Now, in order to understand who you should contact, you need to consider these two things. Number one, the goal you're trying to achieve, and number two, the size of the company. Let's talk about how goals impact your contact first. Let's say you're pitching a guest post. Your goal is to have someone within a company give you the okay to publish your content there. Now, you wouldn't contact an author from the blog or a webmaster because they're not going to be the decision makers when it comes to having guest writers. You'll probably want to contact the editor. Now, the size of the company can also play an impact on who you contact. Let's continue running with the guest posting example. Assuming you wanted to guest post for Ahrefs blog, contacting our editor wouldn't be effective. At the time of making this video, we have a team of seven in-house writers, and our editor's job is to make sure that our posts flow, are grammatically sound, and look perfect. You would need to contact the head of content, because he's the person who would give you the yay or nay on a guest posting opportunity. All right, let's talk about requesting edits to an existing post. Contacting the author would be perfectly reasonable because they're the ones who wrote the content and would know it best. Contacting the editor would also make sense because they have the power to link and if given a good enough reason, they might do it. Now, for one of my recent link building campaigns where the goal was to get links in existing posts, I kept track of the titles of people who we sent pitches to and our link acquisition rates. So 7.56% of authors linked to us. 7.55% of editors linked to us. Surprisingly, 4% of generic emails linked to us, mostly small companies, and just 1.64% of other titles like content marketing manager or webmaster linked to us. Bottom line, who you contact matters. 
you need to contact people who can actually add your link to their page. If they don't have the power to do it, then your outreach pitch will be more or less pointless. Now, identifying who to contact is pretty quick and easy. What's arguably the most time-consuming part of the entire link building process is finding these people's emails. And to make matters worse, you don't even know whether these campaigns are going to convert to a good number of links. But there's a way you can find emails quickly and test your campaigns without investing a ton of time into them. It's called the Blitz List, and that's what we're talking about in the next lesson. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what I call a blitz list. And a blitz list is simply a fully ready to send outreach list, which is generated based on a sample of your vetted prospects. And in my opinion, this is the key to testing outreach campaigns efficiently because the blitz list serves two distinct purposes. Number one, it's going to save you a ton of time from finding emails because it's all done programmatically. And number two, because only a sample of your big prospects list will be contacted, it's going to help you validate your outreach pitch. Basically, you'll get an idea of how successful your campaign will be in under an hour, so you can make an educated decision of whether it's worth continuing with the campaign, pivoting, or canceling it altogether. Now, before we get to the scaling process, let's briefly look at how single emails are usually found. So assuming you're contacting the author of a post, you take that author's name, and run a search through an email finding tool like Hunter. And if you were taking an extra step to clean your list of prospects, you'd verify that the email is deliverable using a tool like Neverbounce. Now, when you're finding someone that's not the author, the process takes significantly longer. You might look through a team page or the employee directory on LinkedIn to find the most appropriate contact. Then you'd have to run the names and domains through Hunter and validate again with Neverbounce. Now, assuming there is no team page or employee directory, you might look at their Facebook about page or a terms and conditions page only to find generic email addresses. And by this point, if we're being honest, we're kind of getting desperate. The process of finding and validating email addresses is extremely painful and time consuming, which is why people look to networks like Upwork and Mechanical Turk to get people who will find emails for you. And while this might sound smart, I've personally worked with over a hundred different email finders on various networks, and my experience was nothing but awful. Some freelancers will find people's personal email addresses like a Gmail address, but you shouldn't be contacting them there unless it's stated on their site. Others will provide lists of invalid email addresses or generic email addresses when there are better options. Plus, human error is real. Now, for those of you with deep pockets, you might do it in-house where your link builders create content, find prospects, vet them, find the emails, and then send the outreach pitch. The quality is usually much better, but it's a super inefficient way to build links. So is good quality email finding at affordable rates a lost cause? No, because there's the blitz list, which is going to help you find valid email addresses programmatically. Now at a high level, you run your list of URLs through Hunter's author API where Hunter will search for the author of the page and show you the email address if it exists. Then you use Neverbounce's API to validate whether the emails are likely to be deliverable or not. To give you an understanding of the scale of this method, assuming you had a list of 1,000 prospects, it's very possible to find 60 to 120 email addresses from your vetted list of prospects and start your outreach campaign all within 15 to 30 minutes. Now, there are three ways you can create your blitz list. The first way is to use Google Sheets. Ideally, you'll want the help of a developer to create some app scripts around Hunter's author finder call and Neverbounce's email verification call. This will give you maximum flexibility in how you format your sheets. Now, if you want something quick and dirty, you can start by using Hunter for Sheets, which is a Google Sheets add-on made by Hunter.io. Once you have it installed, all you need to do is go to the Finder tab Make sure Author Finder is selected, choose the column of your URLs in this box, and when you're ready, hit the Find Email Addresses button. Hunter will then search for author names and email addresses and print them into the corresponding cells when available. But as you can see, it's not perfect. And this is why you need to use an email verification API like Neverbounce. 
Again, a custom app script is ideal in this situation for the sake of speed, but if you want to go the quick and dirty route, then just go to Neverbounce's clean tool, upload a CSV of found email addresses, and then hit the clean my list button. Once it's completed, hit the download button, select all results, and download your CSV file. Now the CSV should look like this. So you can import that into Google Sheets and use the VLOOKUP function to match statuses with your found email addresses. All right, the second way is to create your own custom coded program. This, in my opinion, is the best route to go if you plan to scale email finding and have detailed specifications on how you want your workflow to go. So if you have a link building agency, this, in my opinion, is well worth the investment. Hunter and Neverbounce's APIs are really easy to work with, and for the basic functionality of finding and verifying emails, you should be able to get a basic job done for under $50. More robust systems will obviously be much more expensive. And the third option is to use Google Sheets with a no-code tool like Zapier. This is basically like a blended version of the first two ways I showed you. You get the simplicity of Google Sheets with the flexibility of custom coded. The downside is that it can take a while to set up if you're not familiar with logic programming. Plus, you'll have to use one of Zapier's paid plans when app scripts would just be a one-time feed to a developer. I won't expand on how to use Zapier because I already made a full tutorial on creating this method with the APIs I mentioned, so I'll link that video up in the description. Now, after you've run your URLs through these APIs, you should have your blitz list of ready to send emails based on a small segment of your vetted list of prospects. But before we can actually send these emails, you need to choose the outreach approach you'll go with and write up an email template. And that's what the next module is all about. I'll see you there. Hey, it's Ammo and welcome to the fourth module, which is all about link outreach. Now in this module, we'll cover three link outreach approaches, the one that I recommend for the prospecting approach we've already covered and how to write these emails for a link building campaign. So let's get this lesson started and talk about the different link outreach approaches and their pros and cons. Now, there are traditionally two approaches to outreach. The first is the shotgun approach. This is when you send the exact same email to all prospects and the only personalization field might be the prospect's name. Now, the main pro of this method is that it's fast because it basically removes the vetting stage of the link building process. As for cons, you'll naturally spam people, burn bridges or taint your brand's reputation, risk building links on sites you wouldn't typically want them on, and you'll likely burn email addresses, which can be a real problem if you're building links at scale. The shotgun approach is a pure numbers game, and it's worked effectively for a lot of people. But personally, it's not for me, because the potential negative impacts on brand far outweigh any quick wins you might get from it. The second approach is sniper outreach. Now, this is literally the opposite of the shotgun approach. The sniper approach is when you carefully pick pages and websites you want to get a link from. And rather than using cookie cutter email templates, you'll send personalized emails where your first contact may be to start a conversation rather than to get a link. Now, the pros are that you'll get better links, potentially start relationships that go beyond the one-off link, and your link acquisition rates will probably be higher. As for the cons, it's not scalable at all, it can potentially take months to get a link, and it requires above average skills in negotiation, persuasion, and actually understanding people's desires. So for my personal taste, pure sniper outreach is too slow to grow in a popular industry where links are a requirement, but I'll still do it for links that are tough to get or where the relationship is more important than the link itself. Now, you don't have to use either of these approaches exclusively, or any of them for that matter. If you think back to the previous modules in this course, I taught you how to find link prospects in a very specific way, which was essentially to find and segment prospects by linkable points. And if you followed along with this method, then you'll see that neither of these outreach approaches are optimal. For example, if you were to use a shotgun approach for these prospects, it wouldn't make much sense because then all of the upfront research and segmentation work would be for nothing. Similarly, the sniper approach doesn't really make sense either because each segment of prospects has a lot in common. So you don't really need to do 100% bespoke outreach for each and every prospect. 
And this brings us nicely onto the link outreach approach I recommend in most situations, which is the hybrid approach. Much like the shotgun approach, you send emails to a large group of prospects. And similar to the sniper approach, the emails are personalized to a degree. And the personalization is usually based on a commonality among a segment, otherwise known as a linkable point. Hence, it's kind of a hybrid approach to link outreach. The pros of this method is that you're able to send personalized emails at scale, and link acquisition rates from my experience are typically in the 5-12% to range. As for the cons, it can be quite difficult to consistently find seed prospects that are actually good, meaning you need to be able to analyze data and creatively come up with angles, which sometimes won't work. Now, regardless of the approach you use, the anatomy of the email should more or less be the same. It's about finding a good reason for contact and providing a value proposition that will resonate with a cold audience. And this is by far the hardest part of outreach. So in the next lesson, we're going to dive deep into finding good reasons for contact and what quote unquote value looks like when sending outreach emails with the hybrid outreach approach. In this lesson, we're going to talk about scaling so-called value using the hybrid outreach approach. Now, in the previous lesson, I mentioned that outreach emails usually have a similar anatomy. They include a good reason for contact and a value proposition. And the great thing about using the hybrid approach is that your linkable point will be your good reason for contact. For example, if they have an outdated stat, your reason for contact is to tell them about it and share new data. Or if they've mentioned a specific tactic like the 50-30-20 budget rule, then you can use that to set the context of the conversation. Now, finding a value proposition that appeals to the majority is the tough part because value is subjective to the person receiving the email. But because the hybrid approach forces you to segment prospects, your value propositions can be more impactful because of the similar attributes that prospects have in a given segment. Now, there's no set list of value propositions because it depends highly on the context of your linkable point. But a good way to start brainstorming value props is to think about how your reason for contact impacts prospects and their audiences. For example, a while back, I was working on a natural health site and noticed that an article from a large publication was recommending to consume cinnamon to lose weight because of a chemical compound called cinnamaldehyde. Now, a top leading essential oils expert specifically states in his book that you should not consume too much cinnamaldehyde because it can kill you. So how many people are saying this? Well, with a search like this in Content Explorer, you'll see that there are hundreds of pages. So we have our reason for contact that's going to set the context of our email. Now, how does this impact prospects in their audience? And does it impact them enough to make an edit to their post and potentially link to us? Well, if someone follows their tips, there could potentially be lost lives and lawsuits. So in my eyes, there was potential for a pretty strong pitch. So I actually updated my page on cinnamon essential oils stating these facts and contacted prospects letting them know of potential dangers in their content. I also shared a link to the $100 plus book and a page number as a reference to strengthen my pitch. And of course, I offered the TLDR which was written in my post which could be accessed for free. As for the results, I was able to secure some top-notch links from big publications with an almost 20% conversion rate. Now, it's important to note that my email was not about inducing fear into prospects. It was written to highlight the importance of updating their content. So my link outreach was actually fun to do and it was well received. Now, pitch angles don't always have to be about life or death and they won't always be this strong, but sometimes that isn't even necessary to get good results. I'll give you an example from our SEO stats campaign. As a quick refresher, we noticed that a competing page had a ton of backlinks because of the stat 93% of online experiences begin with a search engine. And that stat was super outdated and not even on the target page, making all links based on that stat irrelevant. Now, the reason for contact is that the 93% stat they mentioned isn't on the page. But to be frank, this reason is no better than saying, you have a broken link. So how does this impact prospects in their audience? Well, the truth is that most people won't care because everyone has outdated content on their site and it's impossible to keep everything up to date at all times. 
So the angle we went with was to tell them that the page they're linking to doesn't even mention the stat. And we accentuated how outdated it is. We said something along the lines of, that stat is actually 14 years old. More recent research suggests that this number has gone down to 68% because of X, Y, and Z. In other words, our value prop was fresh data to keep your content up to date. As a result, we had a conversion rate of 6.8% on this campaign with no follow-up emails. Not bad, but not great. So how could we have made this appeal to more people? Well, seeing as there was a huge change in the data point, 93% to 68%, one thing we could have done was to offer to rewrite a paragraph or a part of their article to make it reflect current data better, whether they link to us or not. This isn't the strongest pitch, but in my opinion, it's better than what we had before. So bottom line, when you're coming up with value propositions, try and brainstorm ideas by segment. Use your reason for contact as a starting point to understand how linking to you will impact prospects and benefit their audience. It's not an easy exercise, but you'll find that strong value propositions that are tied to your linkable point will A, create a very easy to write outreach email, and B, can lead to incredible conversion rates for link acquisition. Now, when people use templates, the result is usually a robotic sounding email. And that's likely the reason why the majority of outreach emails in your inbox seem like spam. So in the next lesson, I'm going to give you some tips and exercises to write templated outreach emails that don't sound generic. In this lesson, we're going to talk about writing templated outreach emails that are personalized and don't feel or sound too templated. Now, why does this matter? Well, link building is often looked at as a spammy tactic from both SEO outsiders and insiders, and for good reason. People are sending emails like this, that sound like they were swiped from templates on blog posts. They're disingenuous and clearly transactional. Now, if you're sending these generic templated emails, your chances of standing out are slim and link building is truly only a numbers game. In other words, emails like this are more likely to get marked as spam than to lead to a link. Now, there's no video, book, blog post or course that's going to make you a master writer of outreach emails. Practice and feedback are what will help you get better at the skill. And for that reason, I'm going to walk you through some examples and an exercise to help you get your reps in. But before we get to this exercise, let's look at a typical templated email and talk about why it sounds templated. So in my opinion, a huge reason for these robotic sounding emails is that people focus on creating templates rather than writing emails. And when you work off of a template, you're basically searching for predefined personalization fields to satisfy the template, when in reality, it should be the other way around. For example, a template might look like this. Hi name, I was reading your post on topic and really liked how you mentioned something that you liked. No matter what you put into these blanks, it's going to sound unnatural. Now, a much better way to do this is to write a personalized email to one of your prospects and then extract personalization fields, if any, to see if it can be templated. Here's what an email might look like. Hey Frank, wondering if you've tried broken link building since you wrote this post in 2019, it seems. I know that the Forbes writer you mentioned said they converted links at 20%, but boy oh boy, it's tough to believe you can still convert links like that today with BLB. So if we extract the personalization fields from the sample, then we need to find the URL of the contacts page, the publishing date, the competing pages company name, and the 20% part. Now, the beautiful thing about the hybrid method is that all of these personalization fields, aside from the year of publishing, can be easily templated because we're sending emails to segments. For example, our segment for the example we just went through would be people who linked to Forbes hypothetical page on broken link building because of their 20% success rate. Now, if we were to templatize this email, it looks something like this. Hey name, wondering if you've tried broken link building since you wrote this post in year it seems, and we'd link to the prospects URL with some HTML and a merge field. And everything after that will be the same because we're only sending this email to our 20% segment. Now, if you struggle to write natural outreach emails, 
you can do the simple exercise of writing an email and extracting merge fields from it. Let's dig deeper into the exercise and write an email together. But first, we need a scenario to work with. Let's say that you have a personal finance blog and you wrote an awesome post on budgeting. Now, as you're researching a competing page's link profile, you notice that a good chunk of their links are attributable to a point around the 50-30-20 budgeting method. Now, for illustration purposes, we'll say that you have a way better budgeting method that you created. So a rough pitch angle can be something like, the 50-30-20 budget rule sucks. I made this awesome new method that you're going to love because of X, Y, and Z. Great, we have a segment to work with and it's time to start drafting our email. The first thing to do in this exercise is to choose one prospect from your segment and write an email to them as if they're a friend. Let's choose this one. Now, the page is clearly recommending to use the 50-30-20 budget rule. And again, our hypothetical post has a better method. Let's call it the 40-10-10-40 rule. So as a first draft, I might write, Yo, quick question. I'm seeing that you recommend the 50-30-20 budget rule on your blog. Are you personally using this? Because I think it's a super impractical way for millennials to save with mortgage payments, kids, college funds, etc. Basically, the money printers are going burr. If interested, I wrote about why the 50-30-20 budget rule is impractical and an alternative method on my blog, which is better for millennials, the 40-10-10-40 rule. There's a spreadsheet in there too if you want to give it a shot. Let me know what you think and a link to my post will be super appreciated if you agree with my method. And if you don't, fight me. Kidding. Miss you. Sam. This is obviously far from what you might send to someone. But the point of this step is to A, break away from templates so you sound a little bit more like yourself and B, to go in with the mentality of delivering value because that's what friends do for each other. All right, so that email took me around four minutes to write. So I'm going to move on to step two, which is to go through your first round of edits. And at this stage, you'll wanna remove any empty statements, false flattery, and language you typically wouldn't use with a stranger. So I'll change yo to hey Frank and remove the quick question part because it's kind of pointless to have. Now this part where I say that it's a super impractical way to budget comes off a bit strong and arrogant. So I'll change it to, are you using this method? Because I've personally found it to be an impractical way for millennials to save with mortgage payments, kids college funds, etc. And in my opinion, this personal angle changes the context from people who use this method are dumb to it didn't work for me. Now the money printers going burr part is a finance meme related to the federal government printing money, which has led to asset inflation. It doesn't really sit well with me, so I'll change this line to, with rising inflation and wages having barely budged, allocating 30% to wants and 20% to savings seems like a recipe for disaster. The next part seems fine at first read, but the LMK part that comes after is a bit too informal. Plus, let me know what you think is an empty statement. So I'll rework the sentence to, if you agree with my method, a mention in your post would be super appreciated. All right, so this looks okay for me, so I'll move on to the next step, which is to ask someone for feedback. And to give you a real simulation of what this might look like, I asked my friend and outreach extraordinaire, BB Raven, for input. Let's take a look through her feedback. So in the first part, I'm seeing that you'd recommend. She says that it's good to get straight to the point, but prefers to use some sort of nicety comment before the intro to make it sound more genuine and not like a zillion other emails. And the example she uses is wishing people an excellent cup of coffee. Now, she's not talking about fake flattery or anything like that. If you've ever talked with Bibi, when she says these things like, hope you have an excellent cup of coffee, I think she actually means it. But it's just not me. So I'm not going to take her suggestion here. And I think an important takeaway from this is that you shouldn't try to sound or be like someone else because it will surface in your email copy and play against you. All right, so next, she left a comment on this part, your blog, and she suggests using the brand's name because a lot of link builders use this phrase in their outreach. Now, while I agree on the whole, there are two reasons why I'm hesitant to take this suggestion. Number one, I don't think it'll be worth the additional effort to manually format each person's brand name. And number two, emails sometimes look more templated to me when people use a personalization field here. 
For example, if I had a blog at samo.com and someone said, I'm seeing that you recommend the 50-30-20 rule on the Samo blog, it just sounds weird. So rather than potentially overcomplicating this part, I'm going to pass on this suggestion. Now, the next part, I say, are you using this method? Because I've personally found it to be an impractical way. And Bibi brings up a couple of great points. First, she says that I've made this email about me and the site owner slash editor, when it should be centered more on their audience. Agree. Second, she says that this isn't really a question, but it's actually implicit criticism. And the example she uses makes it crystal clear. Are you still using hairspray? Because I think it's bad for you. It just sounds awful. So I think this needs to be rewritten. Now, the next comment is a small one, and I fully agree with her. On the etc. part, she says it just adds vagueness to the statement. There's no denying that. Moving on. The part where I say, if interested, she suggests a small edit so that I'm speaking directly to the reader. If you're interested. But she offers an alternative which I like better. She says to not make it an if thing, but to write more confidently. So this sentence needs to be reworked too. Alright, on to the more critical stuff. For the pitch part, she tells me that it doesn't sound enthusiastic. Why not mention why it's better? Why it fits their audience? Results people have gotten? And more juicy stuff. Basically, she's pointed out how weak my pitch is, and she is absolutely bang on. So there's another rewrite that I fully agree with. Now on the spreadsheet part, she says it's good not to push too hard because from her point of view, it just sounds whatever, whatever. And if I take myself out of this bubble where all people love spreadsheets, it becomes clear that it truly is whatever, whatever. And within her comment, a suggestion that really resonated with me was to tell them how my budgeting method has brought value to others. So I'll definitely take that suggestion in my rewrite. As for the last part of the email, she tells me that the sentence sounds similar to what other link builders use. So basically, another rewrite that I agree with. And for the sign off, she says to use a more creative, warmer sign off. I'm actually fine with cheers, but her may the budget be with you made me smile. So I'll use something along those lines. Last but certainly not least, she made a comment on the overall flow of the email. She said, Maybe it's weird, but I also like to look at how you start each section in your email. In this case, it's I'm if if. Now, when I saw that, I realized how focused the email is on myself and my passive statements. All right, so after soaking in all of her feedback, I took another 15 to 20 minutes to rewrite the email, and here's what I came up with. Hey Frank, I see that you're recommending the 50-30-20 budget rule on your blog. It's definitely a great method if you own assets, but it has some drawbacks, especially for millennials and households that make under 80k per year in the US. With rising inflation, money printer go burr, and wages moving at a much slower pace, most households need to allocate more than 50% to needs and have very little left for wants, let alone savings. Another budgeting method that your audience might appreciate is the 40-10-10-40 rule. It's when you… whatever it does, because it's not actually a real thing. It's work for people like Jane, a single mom from Ohio who's now able to contribute to her children's college savings, Derek, a recent grad who was able to pay off his student loans in two years with the help of our spreadsheet, Jamie, an executive at a tech company that's now saving 23% more each year, which she donates to charities. I wrote about this budgeting method on my blog and would love to get your thoughts and opinions. Also, if you dig it, a mention in your post would send me to the moon. Happy budgeting, Sam. It's a bit long, but I'm relatively happy with this email. So let's move on to the next step, which is to see if it can be templated without sacrificing the personalized feel. So assuming we were sending this to anyone who's recommending the 50-30-20 budget rule, I think the only thing that would need to change is the name of the recipient. And the size of our segment in this case would be up to 465 prospects. Now all you have to do is rinse and repeat the same steps for your other segments and you should be able to do hybrid outreach in an effective and impactful way. Now everything I've shared in this course from prospecting to vetting to outreach can be done by yourself. But if you really want to scale up your link building operations, then you'll need a team, a system and workflows to follow. And that's what the next module is all about. In module 5, 
we'll be looking at link building from a managerial and operational perspective so you can help your team reach maximum efficiency in your link building efforts. I'll see you there. Hey, it's Sam Owen. Welcome to the fifth module, which is all about building a link building team and creating efficient systems and workflows. Let's kick things off with the first lesson in this module where we'll talk about structuring and hiring different members for your link building team. Now, there are two team models that I've seen work. The first model is to have a team of all-in-one marketers who do everything from writing the content to finding prospects, finding emails, and doing all the outreach. And the second model is when each team member focuses on just one part of the link building process. For example, you might have a prospector who only does prospecting, a vetter who only does vetting, and an outreach manager who only does the outreach. Now, the first model can be effective because the content creator will know their content best, and they'll also have a good understanding of who their link prospects are. But I've never seen a team do this efficiently. Reason being, no one is a master of all the stages in the link building process, and no one wants to do all of these things. For example, content creators might love the content creation and prospecting aspects, but I highly doubt that many will enjoy finding emails, vetting prospects, and or doing email outreach. This leads to inefficiencies and sloppiness in areas where these all-in-one marketers aren't as strong. As for the second model, it's much more efficient because each person handles a part of the link building process. They become masters of their role, and over time, synergy is created within the team, leading to a system that works like an efficient assembly line. Everyone's doing their part. I'll expand on why I think this is the best way to go in the next lesson when we talk about systems, but first, let's talk about the different people you'll need to hire, the skills, traits, and qualifications you should look for, as well as an overview of their roles and responsibilities. So the first person is a prospector. Now, a lot of people look at this job as lower level, and I think it's because prospectors are often given an SOP to find prospects for common link building tactics like broken link building or the skyscraper technique. These are easy to put into a step-by-step -step process because it rarely requires creativity. But when you're going with the seed and lookalike approach that I taught in module two, it's a little bit more of a bespoke experience where you need to be able to analyze data and creatively execute on it. And that's why I think prospecting is arguably the most important part of the link building process for the seed and lookalike approach. Your campaign success is dependent on the relevance and quality of your prospects. Meaning if you get your prospects wrong, then your outreach will be ineffective and vetting would have just been a waste of time. Now, as for skills and qualifications, this person should have strong knowledge in SEO, have solid researching skills, be an analytical thinker, and be creative. And their roles and responsibilities will primarily be behind the scenes. They'll work with the outreach manager to come up with pitch angles, work with content, design, and dev teams to ensure all assets are ready. And they'll set up the campaigns in a data management tool like Google Sheets or whatever you use in your organization. Now, their role also overlaps a lot with the project manager. And for that reason, I think they're usually the best person to manage projects until or if you need a dedicated PM. All right, next up is the vetter. Now, this person's job is to qualify and disqualify prospects based on a set list of criteria. And this criteria will vary depending on your organization's SOPs and requirements. As for skills and qualifications, the two things I look for are attention to detail and their ability to follow instructions consistently. Now, their roles and responsibilities will actually be the most time consuming. The majority of their time will be spent reviewing prospects in their pages to ensure they meet your list of quality standards. They'll also update prospect statuses in your spreadsheet and potentially find email addresses. Now, the reason why I say potentially find email addresses is because some people prefer to hire a dedicated email finder. But from my experience, my vetters have always done a better job at finding email addresses. Plus, the blitz list eases quite a bit of this pain too. All right, the final person on your team will be your outreach manager. This is the person responsible for sending all emails and managing the relationships that come from them. And because good outreach is all about relationship management, the skills I look for include 
strong communication skills, good with people, organized, strong copywriters, and creativity. As for roles and responsibilities, they'll be writing emails, templatizing them, and building and maintaining relationships with key people. Now, contrary to what many believe, outside of the prospector, I don't think vetters or outreach managers need any link building or SEO experience. The best vetter that I've worked with had a background in SaaS quality assurance, and one of the best outreach managers I've worked with had a strong background in sales. And the outreach manager I'm currently working with has a strong background in relationship building and copywriting. So in my opinion, when hiring and building your team, it's important to focus on the core competencies of the role rather than looking for SEO specialists. Things like metrics are easy to teach, while creativity and people skills are not. Now, whether your team has a strong background or no background in SEO, you're going to need a system for them to work in. And the system is going to help you stay organized because there are a lot of moving pieces in a link building campaign. And it'll also smoothen out your processes to maximize your efficiency. So in the next lesson, we'll talk about the five key components to create a link building system. In this lesson, we're going to go over how to create a link building system to maximize your team's effectiveness and efficiency. Now, systems are key to scaling. They help your team stay organized and smoothen out processes. But many people think that a system is just a list of steps where you hire people to fill those roles. For example, an assembly line might have spots for three people, a packer, an inspector, and a sealer. The first person is responsible for packing the box. Then it moves down the conveyor belt to the second person, who's responsible for inspecting the contents. Then it moves down again to the final person, who seals the box. Everything runs like a well-oiled machine, and each person is doing their part. Now, while this all seems well and good, complex systems will almost never work this smoothly. And there are two reasons for that. Number one, systems need to be customized for the organization and the people in it. For example, an organization may choose only to contact editors with bespoke emails to protect potential damage done to their brand via templated emails. Or a company that outsources link building may not want to give you an at domain email which can potentially change the angle you go in with. And number two, the efficiency of a system is fragile. For example, if the first person in our assembly line were to quit, then the other two people have nothing to do. But that's an easy fix. Just hire and train someone else. The real fragility in a system that's built for scale is alignment. For example, let's say the first person packs the box and then the package moves down to the second person. They check the contents and they're like, hey, you can't just throw the item in the box like this. You need to place the item so it's facing this way. And then the first person might be like, who cares? They might continue to argue with no real conclusion. All the while, the third person is just waiting to seal the box and the queue of items are just building up. In other words, while the system is designed to move in the same direction, the people aren't aligned, which makes their impact null. Now, because of these reasons, I'm going to share the five key components to create a link building system that will be right for your organization. All right, so the first component is the structure of the team. Ideally, you wanna have different team members handle different parts of the link building process. This helps to create your assembly line from a structural standpoint, and it also helps individuals to develop mastery in their role. And as people get better at their jobs, things move faster and more effectively. The second is alignment in your company's goals. It might sound cheesy to some, but I think it's important to set specific goals for your link building team. For example, you may have a goal to get 50 new referring domains each month to revenue generating pages. And the purpose of these links is to rank higher in Google and get more traffic as a result. Now, when each member knows and understands this goal, it makes their work more meaningful because they know what they're working towards and what it'll take to get there. A common incentive I've seen companies do is to give their link building team monthly, quarterly, or annual performance bonuses. This can help to further incentivize the team as a unit because each person depends on the other to reach the company's goals. 
The third component is to create standard operating procedures or SOPs. These are detailed documents and videos that explain how to carry out a task from start to finish. They help to ensure that each person is moving in the same direction towards the same goal. And they're also great resources to have when onboarding new hires. Now, the best way to create SOPs is to actually go through the process yourself or have a team lead do it. And while you're doing the prospecting, vetting and outreach, you should document the process as if you're teaching someone who's never done it before. And when you hand these off to new employees, it should ease quite a bit of the handholding that you'd have to do otherwise. At Ahrefs, we create SOPs for pretty much every marketing channel. We have them for our blog, for our YouTube channel, and of course, for link building. All right, the fourth component is to use a project management tool. Project management tools like Trello, Notion, Airtable, and Asana are a great way to organize all your campaigns in one spot. And they're particularly useful if you have multiple campaigns running simultaneously. Let's look at an example using Kanban boards in Notion. As you can see, I've created five columns and named them brainstorming, prospecting, vetting, outreach, and completed. These represent the various stages that a campaign may go through. I've also created some cards which represent campaigns. Now within each of these cards, you can assign it to a team member, change statuses, add custom fields and files, leave comments and tag other members in your organization, and add whatever you'd like in the description area. This will help you stay organized by keeping your assets in one place and also all relevant communications should take place there too. Now to show you how this works, let's say that the brainstorming stage went well and it was time for prospecting. The person in charge of the step would then choose prospecting as the status, assign it to the prospector, and then leave a comment to let them know. Now, if we go back to the Kanban board, you'll see that it's moved down the pipeline. And as you continue to progress through your campaign, it'll continue to move down the assembly line. Now, imagine you had 10 different campaigns running at once with a team of five. At any given point, everyone on your team will be able to get a high level view of where each link building campaign is and what they're responsible for. All right, the fifth component of a link building system is to use a campaign management tool that supports simultaneous collaboration. Now, when I say campaign management, I'm referring to the actual campaign data you'll be working with. And the best tool for this is Google Sheets. You can customize your sheet however you'd like and multiple team members can work together simultaneously so no time is wasted. For example, if you had two vetters working on a campaign, one can start from the top of the list and another from the bottom to double the speed of vetting. You can also write your own functions in app scripts, allowing you to connect to third-party APIs. And this is how you'd run a blitz list right inside Sheets. On top of that, Google Sheets has a ton of built-in functions like Query, Filter, and VLOOKUP to name a few. These will help filter large data sets and match data from other sources. Now, no system is perfect and it's going to require some tweaking. So as you go through the process, be conscious of inefficiencies and blockers and find ways to eliminate them with the people who are involved in these processes. And I can't stress how important it is to solve these quickly because a lot of time can be wasted by just dealing with inconveniences that can potentially be solved easily. Now, the system is just the structure of your everyday link building operations. Workflows, on the other hand, are what fuel the system. And that's what your team will be using day in and day out to execute these link building campaigns. So in the next lesson, I'll show you what a hypothetical link building team's workflows might look like in action. In this lesson, we're going to put everything we've learned into action, and I'll show you what a link building campaign might look like from a workflow standpoint. So naturally, we'll revisit some concepts and techniques that I taught in previous modules. And I'll also give you an over the shoulder view of how the system works in reality. Now, a lot of link building teams I've seen typically work with a linear model. The prospector does the prospecting, then the vetter does the vetting, and then the outreach manager sends the emails once everything is ready. Now, I've used this method for many years and it does work, but what I found to work more efficiently is a triangular model, especially when you're using the techniques I've taught throughout this course. So here's what it looks like at a high level. 
the prospector starts by looking for prospects based on a linkable point. They'll segment these prospects and pass over the research to the outreach manager, who will begin drafting email templates for each segment. These are all things we've discussed throughout the course. The prospector will create a master Google Sheet and clean up the list. They'll generate a blitz list, and then they'll pass over the campaign sheet to the vetter. Now, the prospector is out of this campaign, so they'll actually pick up another campaign to work on while the rest of the team does their part. Let's continue on with the vetter's role. The vetter will review blitz list prospects in batches, starting with valid emails found in the blitz list because it's the fastest way to kick off a campaign and validate whether your outreach angle will work. Again, all of these concepts were covered in previous lessons. After they're done vetting this batch, they'll contact the outreach manager and they'll send off the first batch of emails. Now, while the vetting and outreach were happening, the prospector likely finished their work on the second campaign. They would have assigned more email templates to the outreach manager and the vetter would also start working on this campaign too. And the cycle will continue where the prospector picks up the next campaign or brainstorms more opportunities and the system will continue to operate like a well-oiled machine. Now, by this point, none of these campaigns have been completed. They're all just being validated with blitz lists. But once a campaign has been validated from a blitz list, the vetter will start manually reviewing the remainder of the URLs in that campaign. And each day, before they log off, they'll ping the outreach manager to let them know that a batch of prospects are ready for them. Now, if you're used to the linear model, then this might have been slightly difficult to envision. So let me give you an over-the-shoulder view of what this looks like in action. All right, so let's assume that our link building team consists of one prospector, one vetter, and one outreach manager. We'll call them Sam, George, and Josh. Sam, the prospector, starts off by having a meeting with the content lead. They come up with a few different pages that need links, one on content marketing stats, another on blogging statistics, and one for their link building post. Now in this meeting, they establish rough pitch angles for each post and any assets that'll be needed for the content to make the pitches work. So a card is created for each campaign in their project management tool. Target URLs are added, and some rough notes for general guidance are added in the description. All right, so we're done with brainstorming a small batch of campaigns. So as the prospector, I'll drag one of them into the prospecting stage and start putting my research into a sheet. Now, as you can see, the note that I made is same as we did for the SEO stats campaign. In short, we checked link profiles of competing pages, analyzed anchors to create our segments, and then exported our prospects by segment. I won't go deeper into this because we have a three-part case study on how we did it for our SEO stats post. Plus, I've taught the methodology in our prospecting module. All right, so let's fast forward around 30 minutes and we end up with a spreadsheet like this, where we've noted the linkable points, which are the segments, the size of each segment, and some more detailed information for reference. And because our SOP says to add our sheet as a file to our card, I'll do that. Now I'll rename it to something like segments slash initial research. All good. Time to loop in our outreach manager so they can start drafting email templates for each segment. Done. All right, it's time to actually create our campaign spreadsheet now. So for this campaign, we need to export all segments from HF Site Explorer. And all I would do is go to the backend profile of a competing page, search for our segments footprint within the anchor and surrounding text, and then export the report. All of this research was done in the previous stage. Now for this particular campaign, I downloaded 14 reports in HF Site Explorer, one report per segment, and created a merged version of our master sheet with each URL labeled with their segment. And in total, we have 5,538 rows in the sheet. So I'll add our sheet link in the custom field in the Notion card because the SOP says to do it, and we're ready to move on. The next thing I do is filter the results. And I'd start by removing obvious spam and irrelevant pages. So that might be URLs from Blogspot or URLs on .ru and .pw domains. I'd also remove URLs that contain certain footprints like slash job, slash forum, and a bunch of others that should be outlined in the SOP. 
Finally, I deduplicate URLs by root domain, since we won't want to contact people from the same website multiple times on the same campaign. And Google Sheets has a feature to do this. Just select your sheet, click on data, hover over data cleanup, and hit remove duplicates. Our data has headers, so I'll check that, and then I'll choose just the root domain column. Finally, hit remove duplicates, and we're done. But as you can see, we've already done this and our sheet shrunk from over 5,500 URLs to just over 3,300. Now, this list is still quite large and there's probably a lot of URLs in here that we wouldn't want to get links from. So this is when I'd start filtering by metrics. As a hypothetical example, I'm going to filter for pages that have less than 200 visits to their domain from organic search. Then I'll delete all of these rows. And if we remove the filter, you'll see that we're left with 1,360 prospects. From a quick scan, most of these pages look fine from a relevant standpoint. So the last thing I'm going to do is run our blitz list to find as many valid emails as we can fast. And I've already covered how to do this in lesson 3.3, so feel free to watch that for more information. Anyway, here's what our sheet looks like now. As for the prospector, I'm officially done with this campaign. So I'll hand it off to the vetter by assigning him in the project management system and letting him know where I left off. Then I'll go and pick up my next project and rinse and repeat. All right, let's move on to the vetter. Now, because we've already found some valid email addresses in our blitz list, that's where the vetter is going to start. So we'll filter for just valid email addresses. And we were able to obtain this information by using Never Bounce's API. Now, George is going to visit each of these pages and go through our vetting checklist. And for each URL that matches all criteria, he'll mark the status down as ready. And for pages that don't match the criteria, he'll mark them as disqualified. Now, after he's finished going through the valid blitz list prospects, he's going to tag the outreach manager to let them know that the blitz list has been vetted. And we'll get to the outreach manager in a bit. Now, as for the vetter, they'll likely work on the next campaign that the prospector has sent because the point of the blitz list is to quickly validate how successful your campaign might be without putting in all the manual work of finding contacts and vetting URLs. But for illustration purposes, let's say we got a 9.5% conversion rate from blitz list prospects. Assuming that was good in our books, then the campaign is validated. So the vetter would simply go through all the other URLs that don't have a valid status and find email addresses for the ones that are qualified. All right, let's move on to the outreach manager. Now we need to rewind a bit here because the outreach manager's work is dependent on the prospectors and vetters deliverables. So again, before the prospector merged and cleaned the prospects list, the outreach manager was given a sheet like this, where the linkable points or segments were outlined along with additional details. So while the prospector and vetter are doing their work, the outreach manager will be busy writing email drafts for each segment and templating them, just as I had shown you in lesson 4.3 in the outreach module. Once they've done this, they need to set up the campaign in their outreach tool, and this will vary based on the tool you use. Now, once the vetter pings the outreach manager to let them know that the blitz list has been vetted, the outreach manager would go to the sheet and export contacts in the ready status. And in this case, we've built a custom formula to automatically populate this list. Now to avoid accidentally sending the same person a duplicate email, they're going to update the sheet and change any status that's in the ready state to the sent state. Then they'd upload the export file to their outreach tool and go through the outreach process. Now, these workflows are guided by the SOPs and the system makes it possible to work collaboratively in an organized fashion. But something to note is that people work at different paces and with different levels of experience. So you're going to have to monitor and optimize your systems and workflows accordingly. Now, from an efficiency standpoint, with a team of three, you can potentially send hundreds or maybe even thousands of personalized emails in a week, depending on how strict you are with vetting and the number of prospects you have. Now, while scaling can be exciting, you shouldn't be using these systems and workflows to spam people because 
you'll just be doing an overly complicated link building strategy without results to show for your effort. Nothing I've taught in this course is a magic formula and it does take some creativity to execute successfully. Take the extra time to vet your prospects, go the extra mile with personalization, even if your output suffers a bit, and I am confident that you'll find the link building process to be more effective, efficient, and enjoyable. And that's a wrap. Thanks so much for joining me in this link building course. And if you want to get updates with more actionable SEO and marketing tutorials, then consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. Or if you want to check out more marketing courses, then check out hrefs.com academy, where all of our courses are free. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments, and we'll do our absolute best to get back to you. I'll see you in the next tutorial.